Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in Surah Al-Muddathir, وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ The wow in the beginning is like the English capital letter. Like when you start a new sentence, you begin with capital letter. In, in Arabic, wow can be used for many things, over 21 things. One of them is al istinaf to start a new sentence. So you could think of the wow in the beginning as a new sentence. The rest of the ayah says, رَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Now listen to this carefully. What's the first letter you hear when I say Rabbaka? What's the first letter of the Arabic alphabet that you hear? Everybody heard the Ra? Rabbaka? Now listen for the last letter. Rabbaka fakabbir. What's the last letter you heard? Okay. Now listen carefully for the second letter. Rabbaka. What's the second letter? Rabbaka. Ba. Listen for the second last letter. Rabbaka fakabbir. What's the second last letter? Ba. Rabbaka. What's the third letter? Kaf. Rabbaka. Fakabbir. What's the third last letter? You notice something? It's spelled backwards and forwards the same way. It's spelled backwards and forwards the same way. In English literature, we call this a palindrome. Something that spells backwards and forwards the same way. Like Bob or race car. Race car is an interesting palindrome in English. Allah Azza wa Jal gave our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam words that he didn't write down. وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ Allah tells him, you didn't write anything down with your hand, you don't know how to write. So this is entirely an oral exercise for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he, once he says something, he doesn't edit it, he doesn't correct it, that's it. Allah revealed it and that's it. There's no, I didn't mean to say that, let me change the way I said it, etc, etc. Right? It's exactly the way Allah instructed him to recite. The challenge for mankind is, you see, the ayah, the simple translation of the ayah would be, declare the greatness only of your Lord. That would be a simple translation of, وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ Try to say, declare the greatness only of your Lord, in English, or French, or German, or Japanese, or Chinese, or Italian, or Russian, or Urdu, or Farsi, you pick the language. Say it so that it spells backwards and forwards the same way, and say it so you only have one attempt orally. No writing down, no looking up in dictionaries. How possible is that? Subhanallah. I can translate the ayah, but could I translate the miracle in English? If I tell you, declare the greatness only of your Lord, you get some of the message, but do you get the miracle? You don't get the miracle. The miracle of Qur'an is in the Arabic language. And this is just one small example. The Qur'an, every ayah has its own miracle. In one place in Surah Al-Ahzab, in Surah number 33, this is easy to appreciate. He says, I'll, I'll recite the Arabic first. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah, the one to be worshipped and obeyed, did not place two hearts inside of any man. I'll say that again. Allah did not place two hearts inside of any, what did I say? Man. So obviously, who's being excluded here? Women are. Now if he said, he didn't place two hearts inside of any human being, now that would have been inclusive, wouldn't it been? But he used the word rajul, which is exclusive of women, it's specifically referring to men. And what's even more peculiar is the rest of the passage deals with women. It's very interesting, the rest of it deals with spouses and all of that, but the first part of it is particularly assigned to men. The other thing that's also peculiar, and I want you to remember, is that when hearts are mentioned, now where are hearts located? In the chest. And this is actually a figure of speech used in the Qur'an all the time. الْقُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Hearts that are in the chests. In other words, the Qur'an commonly mentions that the hearts, that are, the hearts are placed inside the chest. But in this particular ayah, I'm not going to say verse, ayah, instead of saying he didn't put two hearts inside the chest of any man, he used the word jawf, which refers to the entire body. It's not a restrictive term to the chest. He said anywhere inside of him, he did not place Two hearts. Now this is the two peculiarity, peculiarities I wanted to bring to your attention. And this is kind of obvious. Because a woman 
can get pregnant. And if she does, she can have two or more hearts. But when she has those two hearts, they're not in her chest. But they are inside of her. So Jof is more appropriate. Subtlety in language. I'm going to talk to you about the biggest surah of the Qur'an. That's what I'm going to talk to you about first. The biggest surah of the Qur'an. Now what is it folks? Yeah, this is surah number two. Surah number two. This surah, this biggest surah, number two, is made up of how many ayahs? 286. 286 ayahs. Somewhere in this surah, the ayah occurs, the, I'll recite the Arabic first, and roughly translate after, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى Thus we made you a middle nation. One of the utterances in this surah, that's found in here, is thus we made you a middle nation. Now what's the Arabic word for middle? Wasat. Wasat. The Arabic word is wasat, you don't have to know that. But know that this statement, this declaration occurs in this surah. This surah, was it written? Or was it delivered in the form of speech? speech. And also, as a historical comment, it wasn't delivered at once. It took almost 10 years to be revealed. So this, this one surah was coming piecemeal. And while it was coming down, pieces of other surahs were also being revealed. And the messenger would instruct his companions, these ayahs belong to this surah, and those ayahs belong to that surah. But when the whole thing is said and done, Baqarah, the second surah, is made up of 286 and in ayah number listen to this carefully now in ayah number 143 in ayah number 143 the Lord says we made you a middle nation how many ayahs in this surah again? 286 and where does he call us a middle nation? in the middle in the middle now how do you I understand if you're gonna do this in writing I understand if you're going to do this in writing. How do you do this in speech? And by the way, at the time, there was no concept of ayah number. Like I told you, ayahs, there are 286 ayahs, and there's 143 ayahs. At the time, they never said, haven't you read ayah 12 of chapter 35? They didn't talk like that. They just recited the ayah. They didn't have this number scheme. When did this number scheme become part of the Qur'an? When the Qur'an was finally put into book form, but the generation we're talking about doesn't have a book before them. They don't have that before them. They're, they're memorizing this, and it's completely and entirely an oral tradition. So that's one small example. The nobility given to Jesus in the Qur'an. I'll give you one remarkable example of it. Which nation was Moses sent to? The Israelites. Everybody knows that? The Israelites. Who's the original audience of Jesus? The same nation or no? The Israelites also? Yes. Okay. Now, Surah number 61, As-Saf. There's one ayah dedicated to Moses addressing his nation. And the next ayah is dedicated to Jesus addressing his nation. Keeping in mind that both of them, even though there's a big time gap between them, essentially are addressing which nation? The Israelites. They're the same nation. Okay. Now listen carefully. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَىٰ لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ When Moses said to his nation, begin quote, My nation! Addressing them with what words? What was the first words used to address them? Yeah. My nation. يَا قَوْمِ My nation. Okay. Let's come to what Jesus said. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمْ When Jesus the son of Mary said, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ Sons of Israel. Sons of Israel. Now what did he not say? What did Moses say that Jesus didn't say? Okay, so Moses says my nation, but Jesus says sons of Israel. Now, sons of Israel is another term used for the Israelites, isn't it? Or the children of Israel. You know what we learned from that in Semitic tradition? 
And in Arab tradition, as was carried originally by Abraham also, identity was given by the father. The nation itself is named after who? Not the mother, but the father, Israel himself. And actually in, in the Quran, all of humanity are called children of, not Eve, but Adam. Adam because identity, na nation, is defined by the father. And this is natural in most societies, the last name is given through the father. The, fa the father's name is acquired even though there are exceptions. Now, what I'm trying to get at is to be from a nation, your father should be from that nation. Isn't that obvious? To be from a nation, it's only expected that your father should be from that nation. So when Moses says, my nation, what's he actually saying? That my father is from among you. But Jesus, never in the Qur'an do we find him say, my nation. Never. Every time he addresses them, what does he say? <laughs> Sons of Israel. Now why would he never say, my nation? Because he doesn't have a father. He is a miraculous, he's of miraculous birth of the Virgin Mary. They will, the Qur'an refuses to accept a human father for Jesus, saying, Sons of Israel. SubhanAllah. <laughs>
No. So when Allah mentions their religion, He says when Shu'aib said to them, no brother. By removing the brother from that context in particular, what has been highlighted? What's been highlighted is, there is no brotherhood when it comes to conflict in deen. That's, that goes away. It's very, very profound, precise usage. Because what we are told to expect, case after case after case in Surah Shu'ara is, Akhahum, Akhuhum, 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 and all of a sudden the omission of Akhuhum. Precision. And you could see why that precision took place. You know that both the names you see on the screen, Yathrib and Medina, are they names of the same city? Sure. The Quran speaks about the city of Medina with the word Medina many times, but it only uses Yathrib once. Yathrib is used only in Surah Al Ahzab, that's it. There's no other place where Yathrib is used in the Quran. By the way, both are names of Medina. So you could argue from the devil's advocate point of view hey, they mean the same thing, right? So why don't I just change Yathrib to what? Medina, or why don't I change Medina to Yathrib? You guys keep talking about Qur'an is perfect, intricate word choice. You guys know too that Yathrib and Medina is the same thing. So why not put one in the other's place? What's the big deal? What difference does it make? This is a study more so of history. Before the Prophet arrived وسلم, in Medina, what was its name? Yathrib. After he came to the city, he was unanimously declared the leader of that city. And the city was coined Medina Tun Nabi, the city of the Prophet. For short, the city. Medina is short for what? The city of the Prophet. Because literally, Medina means what? The city. So Medina's nickname is Medina, actually. That's the nickname. The actual name is. Yathrib. Or you could think of it like this. Before the Prophet came, it was Yathrib. After he came, it is Medina. But what's interesting is Surah Al Ahzab, Surah number 33, actually uses Medina and uses Yathrib. Same surah. And what's, really, what's interesting on top of that is Surah Al Ahzab is a Madani surah. What do you know about Madani surahs? Where was the Prophet in Madani surahs? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was in Medina. So already the city should have been called what? Medina, but we see the word Yathrib. You see the riddle here? Right? Now here's the thing. Medina was short for Medina to Nabi, city of the Prophet. When Medina was surrounded by enemy forces, some Jewish tribes got together. They came and they convinced the Quraysh to come back and rally after the loss of Uhud. They went around and made alliances with smaller tribes and turned it into a massive army that surrounded the entire city of Medina. The city of Medina was being held hostage for weeks on end. This scary situation was even worsened because people on the inside, there were people on the inside that were Muslims, but some of them were only Muslim by name and actually there weren't, wasn't really Iman in their hearts. What's that group called? The Munafiqun, the hypocrites, right? Now, these, some of these hypocrites, before the Prophet came وسلم, they were the leaders of what city? They were the leaders of Yathrib. When the Prophet came, they had to give up their positions. They had to give up their leadership because now who's the leader? By default, Muhammad وسلم. When they were surrounded, they saw it as an opportunity to rally the forces and say, look what, he, what his leadership got us into. Right? So they say, وَقَالُوا يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبْ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ They said, O oh people of Yathrib, there's no place left for you. فَرْجِعُوا Let's go back. Go back to what? Let's go back to making it Yathrib again. Let's go back to the way things were before the Prophet ﷺ had leadership. By using the word Yathrib, you know what they exposed? Their true allegiance. Because if they acknowledged the Messenger as their leader وسلم, what word would they have used? Medina. So just by using that word, Allah caught their word, 
exp you know, exposed it in the Quran, and what we learn from that is their allegiances, their, their aspirations were, oh, one day it'll be back to Yathrib again. It won't be a Medina anymore. This becomes even more evident, more clear, clearer, when we go to other places. Surah Al-Munafiqoon, the surah dedicated to who? The hypocrites. Now the surah dedicated to the hypocrites is interesting, it begins with the, the hypocrites going out of their way to show allegiance to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They go out of their way to show allegiance to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ When the hypocrites come to you, whenever they come to you, they say, Oh, we bear witness. No doubt you are certainly the Messenger of Allah. Now the Muslim doesn't have to say that to the Messenger every time. Only when he converts. Right? When he accepts it, then he says it. Otherwise he knows he's the Messenger of Allah. But if you're trying to compensate for something you're feeling on the inside, like a child who says, I didn't do it by the way. And you say, what did you not do? <laughs> right? This is a guilty conscience that speaks. It's the guilty conscience that makes them say, we really believe you're the Messenger of Allah. And in that surah, to show their allegiance on the outside, they said, لَإِن رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيَخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلِ Right? They, they said when we return to Medina, because they were trying to show their allegiance. But when it came to desperate times in Surah Al-Ahzab, the wrong word came out of their mouth. <laughs> and their true allegiances were exposed. Look at this ayah. لَا الشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَنْ تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرِ وَلَا اللَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارِ وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks of all heavenly bodies. Each of them in their own assigned space, they are floating, swimming, rotating. What's he speaking about? Bodies in space, planets, stars, right? Galaxies. He's speaking about all of them doing what? Rotating. Spell out the first words, Kullun fi falak. What's the first letter in Kullun fi falak? What's the last letter? What's the first letter? What's the second, last, and second? What's the third, last, and third? You notice something? What are they rotating around? What, what, what letter are they rotating around? The word he used for rotating, Yasbahun, yeah. SubhanAllah. How do you do that? How do, how do human beings come up with that? Allah Azza wa speaks, and this is not written form. This is not written word. This is spoken word. Allah Azza wa gave this Qur'an to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he would recite it unto the people. So he would recite it as a word. We are baffled even the way it's spelled. Even the way it's written. But it was baffling, mind-boggling, stunning. Really stunning in its perfected form. يقول سبحانه وتعالى إذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب. Allah says when my slave asks you about me, I am near, no doubt about it. I'll listen to the, the rough, coarse English translation. When my slave asks you about me, then I am certainly near. Who's you? Slave asks you about me, then I am near. Who's the word you referring to? The Prophet. Okay, so who's asking who? Who's asking who? Think about it. Allah's slave, a believer, is asking the Prophet. So who's going to answer if the Prophet is asked? Who should answer? The Prophet should answer. So if the slave asks the Prophet about Allah, the Prophet should say, Allah is near. Yes? He should say, Allah is near. Look at this. The ayah, the expected language of the ayah was, إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي 
فَقُلَّهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَرِيبٌ when my slave asks you about me, then say to him that Allah is near. Or say to him that I am near. What happens in the ayah in fact is, when my slave asks you about me, oh, he asked you about me, I'll talk to him directly. I am near. Allah didn't even give the answer through the Prophet ﷺ. The question came through the Prophet. The answer, Allah says, I am so near to you, I'll talk to you directly. Inni qareeb. No doubt about it, I'm near. I'm so near, I can just talk to you. Subhanallah. 